course, you can continue to give online and all those good things. So uh, pay attention to all that stuff that you need to this morning as well. Thanks for coming out today. Appreciate that so much. I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to continue to worship this morning. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for being our God and for loving us. And uh, just grateful for uh, another day of life, another opportunity to worship you right now. I'm thankful for your son, Jesus, who uh, makes it... Uh, makes it possible for us to uh, come before you. Even a guy like me, you, you've cleaned me up uh, enough to be able to uh, have a conversation with the creator, sustainer, redeemer God, and uh, just uh, the creator of the universe. That's an amazing thing to just think that uh, on, a, on a Sunday morning at uh, you know, 9.05 that I can have a conversation with the creator of the universe um, is just, uh, it's awe-inspiring. And so, uh, we just gather uh, together this morning to uh, worship that creator, God, to say thanks to him for loving us enough to send his son Jesus into this world. And we know uh, that the only way that any of us, but especially uh, a guy like me, can have a conversation with that creator, sustainer, redeemer, God, is because of the grace and uh, forgiveness of uh, your son Jesus. So it's in his name we pray right now. Amen.
you pray with me? Father God, we do love you, and uh, we are grateful that you are a God who uh, loves us, and we are thankful that uh, even when things uh, aren't uh, necessarily going our way or the way that we would uh, think they, they should or, or uh, when things are difficult, that you are still God and that you are still on your throne, and, and we are grateful for uh, your love for us and uh, your invitation to be a part of your family that uh, is ever present and uh, so just thank you so much for that we do uh, come to you this morning and just pray for uh, our nation we pray for our world and and uh, the the health crisis that uh, it is involved in we're praying for uh, especially some areas around our country that are are being especially hard hit by that health crisis uh, right now we just lift up the folks battling uh, illness and and uh, we pray for their families and uh, pray for their health and and uh, God we we would pray that you would uh, return uh, you know health to our nation and that we would uh, navigate our th- way through this uh, uh, this pandemic and and that uh, we could uh, return to some uh, well that we would return better than than normal God and that uh, uh, that you would restore us in that way we're praying for the some of the social anxiety and ills in our nation as well and just uh, all the uh, division I think is is uh, putting it mildly right now God and so we just lift up um, uh, you know, our, our, our nation, and, and I pray that the church would be uh, the church and that your love would be clearly lived out by your church, and that's really the message of uh, 1 Peter 3 uh, that we're d- looking at this morning, and so we just pray that we would be the church, God. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, the year was 1968, and there were, uh, actually, there are a lot of similarities between 1968 in the United States and 2020 uh, in the United States. There were certainly uh, the, their fair share of uh, political anxiety going on in 1968. There was uh, its fair share, had its fair share of civil unrest, and, and some of the same issues, some of the, the race relation issues that were dealing with in 2020 were sort of at the forefront of 1968 as well. And uh, we're going to talk briefly about a much simpler topic that has some similarities to 1968 and 2020. 1968 was an unusual Major League Baseball season, and 2020 is, uh, well, an unusual Major League Baseball season. If you're not a baseball fan, maybe you haven't noticed that they haven't played any games yet in it's July 5th, so that's a little unusual. Uh, never happened before. They'll only be playing 60 games this season. We're hopeful that they're going to do that. And in 1968, it was an unusual baseball season. They call it the year of the pitcher. Uh, all sorts of records were set by pitchers in 1968. Don Drysdale pitched a then record 58.2 uh, consecutive scoreless innings. Bob Gibson uh, posted uh, a remarkable 1.12 earned run average in 1968. The last starting pitcher to win over 30 games in the major leagues was Denny McClain for the Detroit Tigers in 1968. Pitchers dominated Major League Baseball uh, in, in 1968. In fact, uh, in the American League, the entire American League hit only 240. They got a hit 24% of the time. The, the, the leading, the leading, that was the leading batting average in the American League, rather, by the Oakland A's. The, the worst team batting average was 214 by the New York Yankees. So at least something was going right in the world, we know, because the Yankees were struggling in 1968. The league together batted 230. The, the, there was one guy who experienced some success in the, major, in the American League in 1968. He led the league in hitting with a record low batting average to lead the league in hitting. He hit 301. He was the only hitter in the American League to post a batting average of 300. And it just started me thinking, when we talk about goodness and righteousness, 
How do we, how do we typically measure goodness? Well, we typically measure goodness by comparing ourselves to somebody else. Uh, the American League in 1968 hit 230. So if you can squeak by and lead the league with a 301 batting average, you've comparatively done quite well. You were a good hitter in 1968, even though you led the league with a record low batting average. I, I think that we need to stop sort of comparing levels of goodness and righteousness in our lives, and, and, and especially because we typically think of things being good when sort of uh, what surrounds us is going well. When what surrounds us we describe as good and prosperous, we think life is good and prosperous. And as followers of Jesus, we can absolutely be good when everything around us isn't necessarily going so well. I think that a section of Scripture and a letter that we've studied the first part of uh, several months ago that we call 1 Peter, we're going to start in chapter 3, and in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 22, Peter offers us three choices that we can make, three choices that we can make to be good even when life isn't. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open them up to the book of 1 Peter. We're going to take a look at verses uh, 8 through 22 in chapter 3 of 1 Peter this morning. Three choices we can make to be good even when life isn't. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning, beginning in verse 8. This is what God's Word says. Finally, all of you, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. All right, a, a really interesting section of Scripture that offers us uh, three choices that we can make to be good when the world isn't. Choice number one is to choose goodness in every relationship. Choose goodness in every relationship. Verse 8 begins, finally, all of you, having unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and humble mind, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing for whoever desires to love life and see good days. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Finally, Peter says, finally. If you go back just to, to chapter 2 and you sort of review what Peter has talked about, and you, you maybe have to backtrack several months when we were in a First Peter and studied chapter 2, but we studied different kinds of relationships. We studied uh, unusual relationships that we don't really uh, 
deal with too much today. We maybe might think of uh, the, the master and slave relationship as employer and employee kind of relationship and authority and, and uh, being subject to that authority, being subject to civil authorities we talked about, and that relationship and what that looks like. And we finally talked about a husband and wife relationship in, in the household and, and the different intricacies in all of those relationships and how we might submit to one another in those relationships. And here in chapter 3, Peter says, finally, because he's wrapping it up, yes, but also because now he wants to address all relationships. Finally, all of you, every believer needs to behave like this in every relationship. In every relationship, choose goodness. Now, how does Peter describe goodness? Well, he describes it as having unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. A unity of mind. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Uh, it, it's so difficult. We've, we've mentioned this before. To be of one accord, to have the same mindset, is just hard to do. And, and we've described it as, well, you know, maybe choosing someplace to go to lunch after church, right? And everybody has an opinion. Or, or if you're like my family, you say, hey, where do you want to go? And everybody says, oh, I don't care. I don't know. And then when you decide, they're like, I don't want that. You, right? That's how we, it sort of goes. And we've all experienced that. And so we know even, even in our families, when we're choosing something simple like, you know, what will we eat for lunch, it's difficult to have this unity of mind, to be of one accord. Uh, Paul in Romans describes it as living in harmony living in harmony. We were, we were talking about uh, in staff meeting about, well, we were discussing the, you know, what the governor's executive order would look like and what that would mean for church and what that means for other areas of life. And Craig, our worship pastor, was talking about marching band, and he was talking about the different rules that marching bands at band camp were following. Now, we maybe don't think about that necessarily if you don't play an instrument, but they're, you know, constantly blowing air into those instruments all of the time. And, and, uh, and he was talking about the fact that there are, you know, there's spit valves on these instruments where they empty out and usually just empty out the, what he claims is condensation and not all spit. All right, well, I suppose I believe that, but gross is gross, right? I mean, anything that you have, anyway, so they, the, but they have buckets where they're collecting this condensation on the field instead of just emptying out the condensation all over the place for you know safety's sake you you have to change how you're doing those things and it just started me thinking about spit and and uh, you know, bands and orchestras, and have you ever been to a, a, a band performance or a symphony or, or a, a musical, and, and you get there early and you listen to the, the orchestra warm up, and what does it sound like? Well, it sounds like noise. You know, if, if you're not, if you haven't been to a, a musical, a play, or a symphony before, you might think, do these people know what they're doing at all? Right? This, I paid money for this ticket. They should really be better than this. You know, and, and, and we, you wait, you show up before the, the, the show, and they're just all warming up, and it's scattered, and it's disorganized, and it's noise. But when the performance starts, and they play in harmony, when they're all on the same sheet of music then it's, it's a beautiful song. It makes sense. And, and w when the church lives in unity of mind, in harmony with each other, then it, it, it makes a difference. It can really work in our world. It can drive the kingdom of God forward. Now, that's easier said than done, isn't it? And, but for the church there's a rallying cry. For the church, there's one thing that we can center on and focus on, and we absolutely have to live 
with a unity of mind in, and that's the gospel of Jesus. It's the story of Jesus. It's the fact that Jesus makes all of the difference. We can, we can uh, live with a unity of mind in harmony with one another. We can have sympathy for one another. Again, Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 15, talks about that sympathy as, as weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice. And we can experience or we can try to experience what other folks are dealing with and have sympathy for what they're undergoing. We can live with brotherly love with brotherly love. Yeah, I, I was walking into the store uh, earlier this week, and uh, I, I was just heading in to get some lunch. So I was going to the grocery store, but I just wanted to buy one item for lunch, and I knew what it was. So I was going to the grocery store, and I'm walking past from the back of the parking lot, and, and a, a lady was pushing her cart into the cart rack, and, and she said, here I have disinfectant spray, and I can disinfect this for you and you can take this cart. And I said, oh, well, that's okay. I just, I just need one, one thing. I, I don't need a cart. And so I went in the store and she put it in the cart rack. And then, you, you know, this is how silly I am, right? Because I'm walking into the store and I, just, I was just after one thing for lunch and, and I didn't need a cart. And she was right by the cart rack, but I started to feel guilty about not accepting the cart that she had offered me, right? Because it, well, Here's the sad truth. It's just not every day that that happens, is it? That somebody just takes, goes out of their way to interact with you and the, share with you this simple act of kindness. And while it wasn't necessary for me, I thought, man, you know, I should have, I, I probably should have encouraged that kind of uh, interaction, that kind of behavior, right? I should have accepted the cart and just said thank you, even if I didn't need it. And, and it's silly for me to feel guilty about that, but that's, that's the sort of brotherly love that we should be living with every day. It shouldn't, it shouldn't surprise us when somebody does that. That should be commonplace, and you, you think about brotherly love in your family, maybe with your kids, and, and, and sometimes it's hard to convince yourself that your kids love each other, but you know they do, and, and when, when they actually live that out, you, you're in agreement with Paul, who in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 and, said, 9 and 10 said, live with this brotherly love and do it even more. Do it even more. Uh, some of us think, well, that's no big deal to, to wipe off the cart w with a disinfecting wipe and offer it to somebody else. And, and we would do that all the time. And, and I would say, that's awesome. But think about how we can do that even more. What, what else can we do to live in brotherly love with one another as a people of God, as his family, as his team, the church, and to share that love in our community? Paul go, uh, or Peter goes on here in, in verse 8 to say, uh, live with a tender heart. In other places, we might describe this as having compassion, having compassion. Certainly, when you look at the life of Jesus, he was a tremendous example of what it's like to live with compassion. I, I'd give you uh, this homework, perhaps. Go to the Gospels and just research compassion, that word, when Jesus had compassion on someone. And I think you're going to discover something that was uh, interesting to me. It was pointed out by somebody else this week to me, but I, I just think this is really interesting, and, and it's absolutely true. And when you read about Jesus having compassion on someone, for instance, in, in Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 44, it's a, it's a story that we're familiar with, most of us, the feeding of, of 5,000 people. We, we remember how Jesus did this with a few loaves of bread and a couple fish from this boy's happy meal, and he breaks it up, and he passes it out. And, and, and Scripture says that Jesus was looking at this crowd, and he had compassion on them. But then as you read through the story, you're going to read, and, and, and over and over and over again. Jesus had compassion on the crowd and he, he, he prayed for them. Jesus had compassion on the crowd and he taught them. Jesus had compassion on the crowd and he fed them. And what was interesting as you look through this story and other stories like it in the Gospels, when Jesus has compassion on different people, sometimes it, it's somebody suffering from leprosy. Sometimes it's, it's a blind man that Jesus has compassion on. Sometimes it's a crowd of people that Jesus has compassion on. But that compassion is always followed by and. 
See, we tend to think of compassion as sort of an emotional response. I feel sorry for them. I have compassion for these people. But real compassion, New Testament compassion, the kind of compassion that was lived out by Jesus was an action. It always included an and. And so as we consider how we can continue to live in brotherly love with one another, we can consider how we can have compassion and not just, not just try to understand what folks are dealing with, but how we can act and share the love of Jesus actively in their lives, just like Jesus did. Peter goes on to say, to have compassion, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Again, Jesus is that great example of humility in Philippians chapter 2. He empties himself, and and, uh, even though he is God, he he puts skin on and enters this world and ultimately dies on the cross in in our place as a sacrifice for our sin. Uh, He was uh, humble in mind, and we can can look to, to be humble in mind just like Jesus. And so there are these five, uh, five actions that we're supposed to take a part in as we, as we look to, to live with goodness in every relationship. But Peter doesn't just limit it, it to these relationships with, with each other as believers that we ought to live with these five attitudes and actions in, but with everyone. He he goes on in verse 9 to say, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. And then he, he quotes Psalm 34 here with this description of what that looks like. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil verse 9 do not repay evil for evil uh, those, those five attitudes and actions are, are really pretty easy to live out in our life when they're with folks we get along with when they're in relationships with, with folks that we already care about and we know they love us. And, and we have our moments for sure because we are people, but most of the time we can figure those things out. But when we are faced with somebody who disagrees with us, who might even go as far as to uh, cause evil in our life, to to, to live against us, to do something against us, then that becomes more difficult. There was a, uh, I was at the uh, grocery store this last week with my family, with a couple of my kids, and we were checking out, and we were at one of those self, self-checkout lanes, and, and the kids had ball games, so I thought I better get some cash in case I have to pay to get into these ball games, and so I'm checking out, and I do the cash back thing, and then I'm having this conversation, and it was a really fun conversation. I was having a good time. I was, you know, behaving in that way that my kids act, why do you behave like this, Dad? And they're kind of like, what's going on? And, and so I was just, I was having a great time. I was loving it, you know, and I was really enjoying myself. And we, we check out and we put the back groceries in the, the cart and we go out to the car and, and I go home. And, and later that night, you know, I pick up my wallet to go somewhere else and, and I think, well, I ha- have some cash. I got some cash and, and there was no cash in my wallet. And I realized that I had walked out of the store, you know, I'd done the cash back and the cash came back, but I just left it there. You know, it was dangling from the little machine in the, in the grocery store, I'm sure. And I thought, well, there, that, that's it, you know, that's a bummer. And so eventually I go back to the store and said, hey, I, you know, here's the receipt, this is what happened, and, and I got that somebody had turned it in. Unbelievable, isn't it? It's sort of unbelievable. And so they turned it in because it really wasn't that much cash, I, you know. And so they turned it in. And so I got that cash and I went to the office later that day and, and somebody at the end of the day came into the office and uh, they, they needed help with gasoline. We typically don't do that. We, we for sure don't ever give out cash from our helping ministry. We just don't have cash in our helping ministry. But he said, he happened to say specifically, hey, I, I know I just need to get to this place and I'm out of gas and I just need like $20 for gas. All right, and so then I think, well, here's 20 bucks that I got in cash back that I never expected to see again, right? And I saw it again. 
And so then I'm thinking, then I'm giving, you know, uh, I'm, I'm th- well, this must be why. I'm supposed to see this again. And so I, I give this guy the 20 bucks. Now that's really easy to do. That's so easy to do when you are blessed to bless somebody else. That, that takes almost no work, right? The, yeah, this is probably why this happened. I, I'm going to say that's why it happened, okay? Maybe something else was, was going on. But I'm going to say that's why God provided that $20 back to me to help this guy out. It's easy to be a blessing when we are blessed. That's not what verse 9 talks about. It says don't repay evil with evil. When somebody is, is mean-spirited to you, when somebody doesn't bless you, then, then don't turn kind to them, but bless them instead. There's another very similar story that happened in the exact same office uh, uh, here at church, and uh, it was a Friday, so uh, most of the staff is, is off on Friday, and they weren't in the office. Our preschool director, uh, Kelly Billings, happened to be in the office doing some things, and, and somebody came in and, and kind of laid out the same sort of request. And, and again, you know, we don't, we don't have cash on hand, but, but Kelly had $20, and she said, okay, well, here's $20, and then this guy said, well, I'm really hungry as is there any food? And she said, I think there's some stuff. Anyway, she left to go to the kitchen to grab some non-perishable things we had there and bring them back. And she, when she brought them back, she found this guy helping himself to 20 more dollars from her purse. And, and he said, well, hey, uh, thanks, and, and I really need more than this. And she said, well, you took more than this. You know, you have more than this already, and, and so that's all the money I have you've, you've taken already. Just, just take that and, and, and go. And, and it was really it was sort of interesting because he left his name. He claimed to, to, to be friends of mine. So she's like, do you know this guy? And I said, I think I know who that is. Yeah, we're not tight or anything. But I think I know who that is just through this uh, same sort of relationship here at church. And, uh, and here's my point, only that, man, when, when somebody wrongs you, you know, I'm not sure my response would have been, here's the groceries too, have a good day, right? When somebody mistreats you, it's far more difficult to do what verse 9 and 10 talk about, to not repay evil with evil, but to bless even that evil doing even that action that is, uh, hurts us. We, we need to live and choose goodness in every relationship. And most of the time in the church with other believers, with people we care about, that is challenging but only to a degree because everybody sort of is caring for one another. When those relationships aren't involved in that, in, in that kind of caring relationship, it becomes much more challenging. Choose goodness in every relationship. Choice number two is to choose to be a great ambassador, a representative. Choose to stand out for Jesus. Choose to be a great ambassador for Jesus. Verses 13 and 14 say this, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good. Peter's sort of asking this uh, question, uh, and he, he said, well, surely when we're good, then, then nobody will, will look to do evil. When we're kind to other people, then, then uh, they won't respond with evil. But the, the reality is, is that every one of us has probably experienced that that's not always the case. That while that's typically the case, and we ought not expect bad things to happen when we are doing good, that sometimes it does, and verse 14 is true. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you'll be blessed, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. It doesn't always work out the way we expect. Uh, Again, a a preacher this week, Kyle Eidelman, uh, said it like this, the difference here is sort of between living with what we believe and what we uh, would describe as a conviction. What we believe in, we are willing to argue about, but what we are convicted about, we're willing to struggle through, even die 
for. And really, when we get to this point where, where we're, we're choosing good and we're choosing righteousness in relationships and we're still not receiving the benefit of that righteousness, we, we have to decide, is this simply a belief or is this a conviction? And Peter says that if we want to, if we want to live even when life, to be good, even when life is difficult around us, we have to live with our convictions. He describes the, those convictions like this in verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make defense to anyone who asks you for reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame, for it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil." But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. This is an interesting description of Jesus. We, we like to settle down with Jesus as Savior. We're going to talk a little bit about that at the end of chapter 3 here. That's sort of our sweet spot. You know, we really enjoy thinking of Jesus as, uh, with His forgiveness and His grace and as Savior. But sometimes we struggle a little bit thinking of Jesus as Lord. Understand that literally here, the, the, the Greek here that, that describes Jesus as Christ the Lord would, would be, uh, the, you know, in the Old Testament, that same language was used as Yahweh of armies. Uh, literally, that translates as Lord all mighty, that God, Jesus, is absolutely in control, that He is bigger than us, that He is God, that He is holy, that He deserves our worship, and that we, we should honor Him in our hearts, in our actions, in, in everything we do, and be prepared to, to be a great ambassador, a great representative for Him in our actions, and also in, in our words, being ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Be ready to make a defense because of the hope that is in you. I was, I was driving home from a meeting a couple of weeks ago. I was listening uh, to the radio. I happened to be on sports uh, talk radio. I, I haven't been listening to much sports talk radio because there aren't many sports to talk about. And so it's much less interesting. But this night it happened to be on that, and they were interviewing this gentleman. I, I, I don't remember his name. I should have paid closer attention. But he is a, a reporter who covers the Kansas City Chiefs. So they were talking about Kansas City football. And this guy in particular, he, it, it's sort of not that interesting to me because he does these deep dives into breaking down plays and, and that sort of thing. And I kind of, it's on the radio, and I'm like, yeah, these. 300-pound guys run into each other, and then somebody runs fast, and they throw the ball. That's enough for me. And so, uh, you know, he was breaking up these plays, and they were talking to him at the beginning. And in his introduction, you learn about this guy that he's a lawyer. That's pretty good. And he's a pastor. Some people say that's pretty good. And uh, he's, he's, uh, he's a reporter who covers the Chiefs, and he writes this newsletter and does all this stuff. And, and that's pretty amazing. This guy is busy, and so he's being interviewed on the radio. And the first question that the person asks him is, how are you doing? And he said, I'm great. And the radio personality said, now wait a second. Wait a second. Nobody should be answering, I'm great in today's world. You know, what's really going on? Because nobody's great. And, and they talked for a while, and, and the reporter said, no, really, I'm, I'm doing great. And he said, oh, I mean, the interviewer, he was, I, no, that can't be true. What's, what's really going on? What's, what's happening? And, and finally, this guy who's a lawyer and a reporter on the Chiefs and a pastor said, look, we can keep having this conversation, but it's going to end in the Jesus talk. And the guy said, oh, well, yeah, okay. And, and so they talked a little bit more, and he said, oh, peace from above, that makes sense. And they moved on, right? He kind of played it off. He sort of played it off. Except that's the truth. When you experience everything that we're experiencing in the world right now, when your heart breaks with all the, the broken hearts that exist in the world right now, 
when you struggle through the, the loss of a job or, or the lack of hours at your job, when you struggle with, with worrying about you know, the mortgage payment, when, you, when you're concerned about your, your, your family who's dealing with illness and uh, you're, you're not able to see them and visit them and, and all of those things are, are just adding to you and, and weighing you down. And for sure, everybody ex- is experiencing that right now to some degree or another. And so it makes a lot of sense why this interviewer on the radio would say, now wait a second, how can you say you're great? How can you say you're great? And here's the answer that that reporter, that that lawyer, that that pastor had, that he was ready to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. It's a relationship with Jesus. It's the difference that the gospel makes in our lives. It's the hope for eternity that Jesus provides for us. And I loved his response. We can continue to have this conversation, but it's, it's going to end with the Jesus talk. You know, I'm going to have to go there if you want an answer to why I am doing great. Because he wasn't forcing this on, you know, his friend. He wasn't shoving his beliefs and his convictions and his faith down anybody's throat. He was gently inviting that radio personality to engage in a conversation about the reason that he is great, about the hope that he has in Jesus. You know, we read these words that be prepared to make a defense. We read those words, and typically in the church we think about being ready to share the, the story of Jesus. You know, we need, to, we need to be great students of the Bible so we have answers to questions. We need to be able to, uh, to, to defend all the different issues. In fact, here at the end of chapter 3, right, there's some really troubling verses at the end of chapter 3 in 1 Peter. And so we think we have to have answers to these really troubling verses in order to defend who Jesus is. And I I wonder if what Peter really meant when he said, be prepared with a defense for the hope that you have, I wonder if he really meant what, that all we really need to do is to sit down and to have a conversation with God, to, to be in his word some, to reflect on how he has blessed us even when life isn't going great, even when things aren't prosperous, to th- consider what is the hope that I have in my relationship relationship with Jesus and just to keep at the forefront of our mind the fact that the gospel changes our eternity, that Jesus changes our eternity and that we are blessed no matter our circumstances because of that relationship. I wonder if he just meant sit back and consider the difference that Jesus has made and is making and will make in your life. And when you're ready to offer that defense, uh, do it with a good conscience so that when you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame, for it's better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. You know, all this conversation in the world around us, so much of, of the news you're hearing about lately, this cancel culture, this idea that if somebody has done something bad in their life, then the good in their life ought to be ignored as well. And, and that's cancel culture in a nutshell. What verse 16 teaches me is that's not a new idea. That's always been going on. And here's the trick. Here's the trick. Peter says, live in such a way that they can't cancel you out. That, that there's no place for them to go and they say, oh, well, this bad behavior cancels out this good behavior in a relationship. We sometimes forget that we have the opportunity to choose goodness in every relationship. We have that opportunity to live in, in, in just as God would direct us to live. And here Peter's calling us to that hard, narrow path. Choice number three is to to choose to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior in baptism. We sort of end at the beginning. 
Because if we want to be good in every relationship, if we want to choose goodness in every relationship, if we want to be great ambassadors for Jesus, if we want to, we want to live with righteousness so that nobody can cancel us out in life, then we absolutely need a relationship with Jesus. That's the only way that's possible. That's the only way we can make it, is to begin in a relationship with Him, and that's where Peter ends the conversation this morning. He says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God, uh, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. He said, maybe you will suffer for, do, for being good, but Jesus absolutely suffered. Uh, the only person without sin in this world was Jesus, and Jesus still suffered once for all. That's the idea that's taught here in verse 18, that he suffered once for your sins and my sins and the sins of the world, that he took those sins to the cross, uh, paying a price that each one of us owes and simply cannot afford to pay on our own. Why? So that he might bring us to God. That sin in our life creates a divide between God, our creator, and his created. God is absolutely holy and absolutely righteous. He is perfect. And as absolutely holy God is absolutely righteous, He can have nothing to do with sin. And so when every one of us falls short of the glory of God, we create this division, this gulf between us and our Creator. And the only way to cross over that divide is by saying yes to Jesus. Jesus went to the cross so that He might bring us back to God. He's uh, died in the flesh. He died on that cross, but was made alive in the spirit. He'd be raised again in the flesh in three days. But in that moment, he was in paradise with God. Jesus makes a way for us to be in relationship with, with a God who is holy and right, even when we are not. We can choose to say yes to that, and, and Peter's going to tell us how in a few verses. On the way to telling us how, he, he kind of takes us on a little bit of a rabbit trail. And there are some really hard verses here that, that are difficult to, to deal with. In verse 19, he says, "...in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few days, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water." So verse 19 is the really troubling verse that Bible scholars aren't sure what to do with, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. There's a couple different ways that theologians handle this, and, and, and some people say, well, Jesus, when he died on the cross, he, he went to hell and preach to people in hell from Noah's day, and, and they do some other things that, that are really just hard for us to figure out how and why and what happened. And what I think verse 19 is really teaching us in verse 19 and 20, that even when things were spiraling so far out of control in the world, that God said, I am, I'm just sick about it. I wish I hadn't created people. That's where he was at with Noah, right? At the time of Noah's flood, when he decides, Noah, you're going to build a boat, and uh, you're going to get all the animals, and you're going to take your family, and I'm going to rescue you through this worldwide flood, because I'm just, I, I wish I hadn't created anything. That's literally the place God was at. And I think what verses 9 and, and, uh, or 19 and 20 teach us here is that even in the midst of that struggle and that darkness, that God provided a way for us to reconnect to Him. And in the middle of that darkness and that literal storm of the flood, God provided Noah and his family and that remnant of faithful believers who, can re, who would be reconnected, uh, his people to God. And so now, just like Noah in the flood and the waters rescued him, then, then we can say yes to Jesus through baptism. Verse 21, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, listen carefully to what we're saying here. Because, because God said, look, I used the flood and the ark to rescue Noah. There was water involved there, and I'm going to save you, and there's going to be water involved there too, but the water doesn't 
doesn't make you clean physically and spiritually. It's the decision you make as you climb into the baptistry, as you are lowered under the water to say yes to Jesus. It's the fact that He died and rose again. That's the power and the imagery and the choice and the action of baptism. And so Jesus saves us and rescues us, and we say yes to that choice, to that opportunity to be a part of His family through baptism. We have that opportunity to say yes to him. Verse 22 ends, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. God, uh, while Jesus humbled himself all the way back to Philippians chapter 2 and that first uh, our first choice, God, uh, Jesus humbled himself on the cross and, and God raised him up to be Uh, Yahweh of armies, Lord Almighty, that every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We have the opportunity to do that today, to choose Him through baptism, to acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior in baptism. This morning, if you've never done that, you have the opportunity to say yes to Him. Come talk to me afterwards. There's decision, decision cards, the communication cards at the next step station. If you want more information, you want to know what baptism looks like, you have questions about that, mark that on that communication card, drop it in the offering box. We'll, we'll communicate this week. You can just talk to me after service as well. We'll help you uh, take those next steps to say yes to him. 1968, the year of the pitcher. There was that one guy who hit 301. His name was Carl Yaskrimski, and he, he hit only 301, but, but here's the deal. As of August 11th, he was hitting a season low 270. He would have to raise his batting average 31 points over the course of, of a month to end the season with his, his uh, league leading average of 301. With, with some simple math, he had to hit a uh, he had to hit over uh, 150 points higher than the league average over those 40 games in order to finish with that league-leading average of 301. It reminds me, baseball always reminds me, that you just you have to keep trying until you find that one thing that makes a difference, maybe in your, your batting stance or, or how you're look, seeing pitches or, or how you're uh, thinking about that at bat. You, just, you keep working at it until you find that one thing. And too much of the time in life, we keep working at it until we find that one thing that we think maybe will make the difference. We'll hear this morning that one thing has been answered for us. We've discovered it. It's a relationship with Jesus. We can say yes to him through baptism. We can can live a life that represents him well. We can choose goodness in every relationship. Every week here at Wallula Christian Church, we remember that, that opportunity, that he's invited us to be a part of his family. We rejoice in the fact that we are a part of his team, and we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made, the fact that he suffered even when he did good for our benefit. We do that through communion and celebrating that together. There's some elements in the middle of your table. You can find one of those cups. You can peel off that top layer. You're going to discover a a piece of bread. Go ahead and eat that bread, remembering the sacrifice Jesus made uh, on the cross for you and for me. You can peel back that second layer and you'll discover a cup of juice. That juice represents his blood freely spilled for the forgiveness of the sins of the, the entire world, for me and for you, for every one of us. Drink that juice and just say thanks for Jesus for suffering even as he did good. Father God, we love you so much and uh, we thank you for being a God who is a big God, a God who, who loves us in big ways, and we're reminded of that through Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us. Thanks for Jesus. It's in his name. Amen.
Now 